one of my earliest memories of Okay, I was I just turned five. Oh my god. <laughs> and that that was um taken in front of John M. Hall's store and I was downtown with my dad and K2 who was a local reporter at the time. She saw me and she put me up on the top of that box and took that picture. Anyway, not long after that, it was around 1956, <laughs> they decided to tear down the post office, which sat right across the street here. Um, it was an unbelievable act, I think, at the time, because it was built in 1906 to honor, um, but to, to show hope and renewal after the fire that destroyed the main street of the town. Um, it was a, a true beacon for the, the downtown area, I think, because it was a magnificent edifice. This doesn't show up, but the next, try the next photograph. And it's another photograph. And this is still fairly early because a clock tower was still added to it. And that's how I remember it as a child. This three-story building with a, this beautiful clock tower. And the old fellows actually erected a white marble fountain in front of it. And there was a horse trough on one side and a drinking fountain on the other. When I was eight years old, I remember, as I said, one of my first memories was standing on the main street crying because they were taking it down. And I, I, I must have understood then what a tragedy it was in some, in some dimension. What really shocks me today is the fact that the building was 50 years old and we took it down mm -hmm. and replaced it with a featureless Pharma Plus and a Bank of Montreal. Next slide. At around the same time, um, as the post office was being replaced, other indecencies were being enacted upon the facades of the main street. Um, the upper portions of the second story windows were, were being filled in. Um, the cornices and those lovely and delightful um, elements on the top were lopped off. And one by one, the stores became modernized. Um, some of them had aluminum siding put over the fronts. And around the same time, they enacted a bylaw outlawing overhead signs, which I guess was a safety measure, but in fact, what it did was to drive a, a whole era of illuminated backlit signs, which were put over top of all the beautiful embellishments and, and erased the band that ran universally along the fronts of the stores for signage. The one real tragedy was taking down the perpendicular Irish cross in front of John M. Hall's store. It was a story and a half tall. You can just barely see it down there. And I think if we have another photograph, it might show up. That was a parade. You can see how, I mean, the, the town had so much detail and so much actual, like, charm. It was just, it was fantastic. If we go to the next one. And that would be the 1940s, which is pretty close to how I recall it. And there's a lot of stores along there for the anyone who was local would remember yeah, them, like the Piccadilly can, and Ink right there, so. As I said, the 60s were brutal. Um, this was the train station that stood at the top of Broadway Street. Um, it was a magnificent, strange little building. The two turrets greeted you as you came up the hill with the port cochere and those deep overhanging eaves. It was spectacular. The, in the interior was even better. It was actually totally intact with, there was tile up the walls this high. Each of those semicircular turrets was a waiting room, one for gentlemen and one for ladies. And the, the ticket wicket would just absolutely take your breath away. It was, it was oak and, and leaded glass and spectacular. And train service stopped in the 60s and shortly after Now we get to look at empty containers at the top of the hill. Mm -hmm. yes. um, shortly after that, they decided to tear down the Central School. It was a spectacular building. It was built, I believe, in 1909. And um, just all the elements are so wonderful on it. And it, it, of course, I suppose was deemed to be not functional or for whatever reason, blah, blah, blah. And instead, they 
decided to build what we have, which is a concrete bunker which turns its back onto the main street. This was the pamphlet that was printed for the opening ceremonies. I can't imagine people sitting in an audience looking at that and thinking they'd done something really great. It's just really unbelievable to me. Um, next on the list with the Victorian bandstand. What's that at the bottom of the park where the two Broadway streets meet? Now, Holly, you could be looking at this from your front veranda. It was, an, uh, there, was so, there was so little information on this that I actually started to think that I had dreamt it, that I thought that there was this glam, like, wonderful Victorian bandstand. But we found this picture in the next one, which proves it. Aww. Now, believe it or not, this was demolished in 1967 at the Centennial Project. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> We've also done a lot of damage residentially and one of the big, biggest shames I think was we took down a cobblestone house on Broadway Street near Mechanic for a, a municipal parking lot. Now having said that there is we have one house, do we have the next slide? The Luck House. Or I call it the Luck House because it was owned by the Luck family when my mother was a little girl growing up and, and she knew them. I don't know how much luck it's going to have to survive. Yeah. I mean this is in terrible danger this house and you know it's it's just, it's unbelievable to me that we are the cobblestone capital of the world and this house sits abandoned and, in, and it will be eventually torched or something terrible will happen to it. I hope not. So these are all my kind of memories of growing up in this town and it was just a very different place. It, it, there was a real depth here and a, and a kind of a magic to it, even though, I mean, ironically, I wanted to leave, but in looking back, it was a very different town um, the next slide will show, it, and this is the only evidence we have of this house, and it was the O'Neill house, and it was out on Keg Lane, just past the fairgrounds. This house was early, early Regency. It was the very first brick house in Brant County. And I remember it was pale, pale, kind of pink salmon-colored brick, and it had the most elegant windows and beautiful doors, and I went through it when I was a teenager, after it had been abandoned. And it was absolutely intact. It was a perfect Georgian interior. Everything was there, the mantles, the kitchen. It was all original. And they demolished it for the gravel that sat beneath it. Now, do you think a few cubic yards of gravel? Excuse me. Gravel are really worth it? it it's, again, I mean, what were we thinking? But no one really put up any fuss. You'll get a, excuse me, you're getting a theme here. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we're really for us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> countless coach houses were taken down up on what was called Quality Hill. For those of you who are, are from originally from here, this part of town was called Quality Hill. That was Lower Town, Upper Town, rather. Um, only four still exist, and the problem was is that they were very expensive to maintain. Like once you didn't have horses to in them. But again, local bylaws wouldn't allow anyone to actually convert them residentially. Hmm. So they came down, one by one, silently they disappeared. And there are only, I think, really four left. This is the one behind Penn Marvian, and it is a resident. I mean, they would have been, I mean, they all were, would have made extraordinary um, residences, but they didn't. And as you all know, of course, it, Paris was a, an industrialized town. That's how it grew and prospered and so on. And we had extraordinary mills here. And Penman's number two was across the river this direction. And it was a massive, a massive complex, um, along with the number one mill on, uh, on West River Street. And again, it was demolished. And then that land sat vacant for probably 30 years because of course it was an ecological hazard and blah blah blah. It, imagine like the lofts and the oh. residences and the that could have been put into that building it just it boggles the mind and just to point out today Holly and Pierre and Debbie and I had the the honor <coughs> of going through the new Wincy Mill and it is going to be spectacular. spectacular. But I mean in comparison to this, but I mean now they're they're um, at least 
uh, re, you know, they're, they're using that and it's becoming housing, which I actually think is good for the town, you know, because there'll be more people at all. I think the downtown will prosper from it, hopefully. Um, I don't think we really have any slides for this next one, but it's just, I'm going to touch on the upper town, which was the oldest part of town, the original part of town, which lay up on the hill there. It wasn't until the l latter part of the 19th century that the commercial part of the town moved down to this area. So everything that's, that's around that area is really the oldest uh, part of town. And in the 1960s and 70s, it was besieged by aluminum siding salesmen <laughs> <laughs> who convinced the owners of all these lovely old Georgian and Regency cottages that were covered in stucco, which was a uh, material known to Paris. And with, in doing that, of course, they erased all of the architectural details. The, you know, the soffits, the brackets, the verandas, the window surrounds, the doors, it all came off. And they created the facsimile of tract housing and removed any vestige of architectural entertainment. I mean, it's just a, it, I, I walk through there or drive through there and I look at these houses and you, I know what's underneath and what was underneath and it's just, it's, it's, it's so sad. As far as the built heritage, I mean, that, that's a pretty good overview. But what I remember uh, is walking around the town and when the raceways were still intact. Um, this was showing them excavating under the street right here below us, actually, and putting the raceway under Grand River North. This would be early, early 20th century, if, if that, maybe 1890s. Um, and beyond it, the river ran open through that parking lot and the next one, and the next one, and to the Nith. And then from the Nith, it ran south again, alongside the Wincy Mill, and exited into the Grand. They were, next slide. This is, um, oh, excuse me, this is not a Manet or whatever. This is a painting of the raceways. They were romantic, they were beautiful. They had overhanging, willow trees, and I remember in, in hot summer nights when they're filled with fog, and it was, that, it was just absolutely magical. This is what you would have seen from your house. Um, there was another series of them that ran along the other side of the river which fed Penman's Mills. Um, and unfortunately, they're, they're all parking lots now. Now, I know we need parking, but as I said, it was a very different town when I grew up here. It was, it was spectacular. Um, for any of you, can I go to the next slide? For any of you who have read this book, or, and all of you should read this book, John Bemrose describes that whole era. He describes exactly when we went to high school. He and I were high school chums. And he does it so eloquently. And what he is referring to, of course, that the island walkers were the, the Walker family who lived on Coney Island, which was that section of town over there which was bordered by the raceways, and hence it was an island. I think, unlike so many other small towns in southern Ontario, we have the natural benefits of the rivers and the hills and the valleys, which give the town so much of its unique character and allow us to view it from a distance, from different vantage points. And from a distance, I think we can still claim the prettiest town in Ontario but when you start to look closer is when it all starts to fall apart because I think the neglect that we have had as, a, as previous generations. Um, my generation, and the, well, I shouldn't even say my generation, I should say the generation prior to me failed miserably at stewardship. I think be, perhaps because I left Paris at such an early age and elected to return some years later, I had a different perspective after having traveled the world and I saw things differently and I did it. And I also had, I always had an appreciation for it. But for over 30 years, I have tried to attempt to speak to the BIA and the council about doing something, about having a criteria program for the, the downtown area. Um, which would include signage and color and lighting and facade studies and all of that. And I beat my head against a pretty much a solid wall for a long time and it came up a couple of times. And then about three years ago, 
um, it, it was approached, I was approached again, and I said, well, I've only got one more kick at the can because I don't have another 30 years left in me, I don't think. And I'd like, I've been told now that council is about to adopt it. We, we I think, we put together a whole like, criteria package with, <coughs> with different groups of people. We handed it over to the community improvement um, pro or program or whatever. They have now enrolled that and, and they're going to present it and council, I've been told, and I know, they are going to adopt it, which is, to me, just, it's so positive because here, here. we will finally, finally. have Bravo. we will finally have some control of what is happening in the downtown area which and we're going to start with this building and I I'm really happy to say that the council has put aside funding next year to take the front of that building right there which is that building when it was new and it was a fire hall previously and I've seen a study that um, the architects have done and I've commented on it and made a couple of changes but it obviously is going to be a huge improvement and I, I really shamed them into do it, doing it because I said they have to be the ones to start. Um, anyway, part of that also is that we would like to move that up the hill to the upper town and start to have some influence over what's going on up there. And part of that, of course, will, will brings me to the old town hall. It is just imperative. I think that we all get behind this and we push like crazy because this building is, well, we've lost so much. It would be to our eternal shame if we lose this one too. It's the oldest, um, the, the first example of Gothic Revival architecture in North America. It is globally so significant and it is the first town hall. And when I say that, I mean, you imagine a village the size of Paris in 1850 deciding to build a building of this magnitude. It's just, to me, it's like building Bilbao. It's, it, it was that revolutionary because they just weren't building uh, secular buildings in this style. So they really kind of went crazy and it's fantastic. Um, I, I just don't know what more to say about it. I mean, I've been so disappointed so many times. I mean, the Anglican Church, like one after the other, these buildings went. But this one, I mean, I think we all understand what we need to do here. Anyway, I've gone on long enough, but I began this lecture by describing Paris as I knew it. I was born here, obviously, and I spent the first 15 years of my life on a farm just outside of town on Rest Acres Road. I've owned property here for 40 years, almost. At social gatherings, I am invariably introduced as, this is David, he's a Parisian by virtue of birth, right? Other people are described as being parasites. Now I think, you know, it's, I, I know that's said in jest, but I also think it's really insulting because I, I feel it's the, the people who have chosen to come to this town, the people, <coughs> excuse me, the people who have embraced it, who have brought us skill sets, who have brought enthusiasm, who have brought, brought different points of view and enthusiasm who love this town, I'm, I'd really like to just dispel that right now and I would like to say that these are the people who will be Parisians, they're you. <laughs>